So just very, very quickly, because uh, Bishop Anthony says my introductions are too long. Um, <laughs> I've been told not, <laughs> and I know my place. Um, uh, Bishop Anthony is the Assistant Bishop uh, to the Diocese of Egypt. Uh, sorry, yes, the Assistant Bishop in the Diocese of Egypt. And he has oversight of 10 countries in North Africa and the Horn of Africa, including Tunisia, um, uh, Libya, Libya, Sudan, Algeria, 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 Sudan, and so on. And if that were Ethiopia. not, and if that were not enough, he is also a canon of Westminster Abbey. Some of you might have seen him on the television last week, uh, committing a faux pas with the royal family when they they visited for Prince Philip's uh, memorial service. But you can watch the news for that. Uh, but uh, he has had a lifelong. Uh, Devotion, I think is the right word, to uh, reaching out to the Christians and the three faiths that are in the Middle East and has um, had a numerous, done, uh, untiring numerous work in that area. Uh, because I have to keep the introduction short, I won't, you know. Uh, so, uh, but you can tell it yourself. Um, so, and the title for his talk is Contemporary Dialogue Experiences. Thank you, Peter. Sister Joe, I've done my best to dress appropriately for uh, following on from a discounted uh, uh, nun and uh, um, taking a, a leaf uh, out of um, the Archbishop's uh, book in, in appearing appropriately before you. Uh, I, Peter, thank you for an introduction. I shared something of my own background uh, on, on Monday and uh, so I'll dive straight into wanting to share with you this evening some contemporary experiences of uh, interreligious engagement, most of which uh, I have been on the margins of rather than a central figure to. But uh, realising that I was the only Anglican here, I think that's true, don't check on online colleagues, uh, but I've, uh, I've slightly recast uh, what I uh, plan to say to give an insight to and ensure uh, that it's clear that I speak out of an Anglican perspective on these matters. I shall be drawing heavily on uh, a document called Generous Love uh, and uh, subtitled The Truth of the Gospel and the Call to Dialogue, uh, which is an Anglican theology of uh, interfaith relations published in 2008. It's, uh, it's been called an Anglican Nostra Artate, uh, perhaps rather presumptuously and not, um, I think, by its authors. Uh, and the document itself acknowledges uh, that the developing tradition of distinctively Anglican theological reflection on interfaith relations has grown within a broader ecumenical context and has drawn significantly on the insights from other Christian churches. So if you find yourself uh, switching off or thinking, oh, that's Anglican, so it's not relevant to me, uh, you may find that is an indicator of some work still to do if you want to make your own some of what we are seeking to achieve in these days. That's fine, of course. The dictum, pray as you can, not as you ought. Pray as you can, not as, uh, as you ought, uh, can be transferred to the sphere of dialogue, uh, whether ecumenical or interreligious. So I suppose my plea would be that uh, even if you find you can't relate to what I'm uh, saying, or you can't uh, engage in this uh, sphere of interreligious uh, dialogue, please offer encouragement to those who can or want to try, as you would to someone seeking to pray. So uh, as a, a former member of uh, Archbishop Rowan Williams' staff, let me uh, quote something from uh, the foreword he wrote for a doctoral thesis of uh, Sarah uh, Markievicz, uh, which researched the genesis and fruits of the Muslim scholar's 2007 open letter 
to Christian leaders uh, entitled A Common Word Between Us and You. I uh, had a part to play in the ecumenical conference that Archbishop Williams convened in preparing his response to that letter, uh, his titled A Common Word for a Common Good, or for the Common Good. Uh, in a way, the, that, that exchange of letters illustrates some of the different journeys to which I will make reference a little later. Anyway, the quote. Dialogue between faith groups is more necessary than ever, and more difficult than ever. No one could deny that we live in a period where religious identity is re re regularly exploited as a driver of conflict, sometimes appallingly brutal conflict, even when coexistence and a level of mutual forbearance have been common in the past. Persuading people to confront each other in a non-violent context, to struggle to get inside the mindset of another tradition, is not everything, but it is an indispensable part of moving towards something better than a cycle of slaughter. Yet, at the same time, modern communications and the hunger for simple readings of complex situations mean the dialogue is constantly undermined by myths and stereotypes. And because of that, a good deal of what attempts to be genuine dialogue can be hampered by an understandable nervousness about unconsciously recycling or colluding with such myths, so that good manners and blandness stifle the hard questions we need to ask of each other. Before explaining uh, one of the ways in which Archbishop Williams sought to nurture an environment in which such questions could be grappled with between Christians and Muslims in this instance, I should like to use a comment uh, by the Anglican Archbishop of Dublin, Michael Jackson, <clears throat> as an entree into defining what we mean by dialogue. Uh, as he addressed the Council for Christians and Jews annual general meeting in 2017, uh, its 75th year, observing that earlier generations spoke instinctively of dialogue. People today increasingly speak of encounter. This is a helpful reminder that particularly in an academic environment, it is easy to over-intellectualize dialogue and lose out on the richness that comes from the cross-fertilization derived from a dialogue of life and a dialogue of ideas. The concept of convivencia contains within it both of these dialogues, even though, as Chaim so effectively showed yesterday, the historical reality in medieval Spain did not live up to the richness of the term. A perhaps romanticized understanding of convivencia would seem to answer the political expedient seen in initiatives such as Prevent or the teaching of British values, namely to move beyond coexistence to social cohesion. But even that romanticized understanding did not seem to me to extend to the term Peter has used a number of times and about which we have heard so fascinatingly from our three speakers already today. The dialogue of the heart. And I say did not because listening to their contributions has opened my eyes to the potential fruit and I shall want to dig further into how Convivencia itself contributed, or whether it was simply coincidental. Being a Christian, I rejoice in having a trinity of dialogues to keep in mind, of ideas, of life, and of heart. And it has been a fascinating discipline to examine the, vari the various dialogue experiences I have and have had in the light of them. But for now, 
I'd like to use the insights of a Jewish scholar to dig a little deeper into the word dialogue. Dr. Ed Kessler co-founded the Wolf Institute in Cambridge to provide an academic framework and space in which people could tackle issues of religious difference constructively. He observes that the word dialogue is often both misconstrued and ill-defined. I have been in the room where conversations between Jews or Muslims, and sometimes both, with Christians have felt obliged to uh, have felt obliged to come together and have simply exchanged established theological positions, more or less politely. That is not dialogue. You could also describe as dialogue almost any communication, such as an email exchange between persons of two differing religious points of view. But dialogue is not simply synonymous with communication. For dialogue to take place, there must be a genuine hearing of the other. Alongside the distinction between dialogue and communication, we need to ensure dialogue is not confused with some of the, quote, related activities that provide an essential framework for, but are not the same as dialogue. Unquote. Interreligious relations are not the same as or equivalent to interreligious dialogue. Coexistence requires a relationship with the other, but does not imply that there is any dialogue, which is why I suspect some religious leaders are happy with coexistence whilst not being open to the consequences of dialogue. Assimilation versus isolation. The comparative study of religions is also not the same as dialogue. For sure, a degree of faith literacy is, and knowledge about the other's religion, desirable, and can be an objective in itself. But my simply learning about Jewish or Muslim beliefs or practices, whether from books or from talking to members of that faith, does not count as dialogue. As Dr. Kessler says, in reality, dialogue consists of a direct meeting of two peoples and involves a reciprocal exposing of the full religious consciousness of the one to the other. Dialogues speaks to the other with a full respect of that other of what that other is and has to say. This is never less than personal, but can develop in such a way as to be extended to a group and even to communities. However, it begins with the individual and not with the community. You might be forgiving, forgiven for thinking that he had sight of Sister Joe's text about uh, Saint, Teresa, uh, sp Saint Teresa's spirituality requiring the specificit specificity of the local, which can then take on the significance of the global. And there is the beginnings of a further dimension to the answer of Chaim's question about how the overlaps and similarities of the mystical traditions of the three faiths and as Reza pointed out, others too, how that dialogue of two ensouled and contemplative persons transforms them, which, although it is only one drop of water, has changed the makeup of the ocean. How many drops does it take for there to be a new ocean, or the same ocean renewed? This sense of the patient building up over time of personal relationships of trust between individuals is a key feature of the dialogue known as the Building Bridges Seminar, which Dr. Williams did so much to foster whilst he was Archbishop of Canterbury. And for 20 years now, the seminar has brought together a range of internationally recognized Christian and Muslim scholars for intensive study. 
these annual seminars, each lasting three or four days, have explored many of the most significant themes in the interface between Islam and Christianity. And indeed, it was sharing a train journey back to the UK from Rome in 2008, after one of those dialogues, that I uh, was with Reza. Uh, Rowan had determined not to fly anywhere that year as a statement of commitment to environmental issues. And I've done a quick bit of research, and the theme for that year of the dialogue was communicating the word, revelation, translation, and interpretation in Christianity and Islam. And Reza gave a paper on the use of scripture in the common word letter to which I've already referred. And you can see that in itself is, can be quite a contested area within and between faiths. But another participant at that same seminar was Abbot Timothy Wright, whose book is on our reading list for this conference. And I'm going to skip over an anecdote that has him as the abbot of Westminster. Um, no, 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 I can't because time. I'll tell you afterwards if I if I finish in time. Uh, but abbot, abbot Timothy and Reza were both at the tenth building uh, bridges seminar in in Qatar, uh, the last one uh, chaired by Archbishop Rowan, uh, where the topic of study was prayer. And uh, if I have time at, at the end, and uh, with his permission. I will share with you a reflection uh, given by Reza, as I think it is beautifully resonant with our setting and the dialogue of the heart. I wasn't there, but I uh, use it to describe one of the features of the seminar, these uh, names, uh, which is to have a core group of scholars, a mixture of academics and religious le leaders who attend most seminars, and come to know each other. Building up that trust and giving space for the dialogue of ideas to spill over into the dialogue of the heart. They are joined by local academics or religious leaders and leading experts in the theme under discussion. They study texts together from the Bible, the Quran, and other seminal texts from both religions. And this is very much in keeping with the approach enjoined in generous love. The Bible, uh, in identifying the message, quoting from uh, this document, in identifying the message of the Bible for the present, the Anglican method brings the insights of tradition and reason to the interpretation of the text in the light of experience. Our presence in and engagement with multi-religious contexts lead us to read the scriptures in new ways. Our scriptures speak to us in new ways when they are brought alongside the sacred texts of other religions in the practice known as scriptural reasoning. For example, believing ourselves to be in dialogue with God enabled through the words of the Bible, it can be a profoundly humbling and creative experience for us to read the Bible alongside Muslims who likewise believe themselves to be addressed by the one God through the text of the Quran. And one of the most profoundly educative experiences for me has been to witness Muslims discussing amongst themselves their interpretation and understanding of their texts. And many of the Muslim participants said the same about the dialogue amongst the Christian attendees. And Jewish friends of mine have said the same about their experience of scriptural reasoning. And another feature of building bridges, at least in the years uh, that I had some involvement, was that there were some public lectures. And whilst most of the sessions were private to the participants, some in smaller groups and some in plenary, the very first building bridges gathering was a bit different 
and reflecting on the appreciative conversation that occurred then, described as, quote, the hard work of listening and remaining serene whilst hearing views and ideas that could disturb and even distress. The kind of listening which is possible only when people do all they can to suspend their desire to judge, to control, to change the other person. Gillian Stamp came up with the description of four journeys, historical, public, private, and reflective. She observed that the journey is an image in all faiths carrying the sense of companionship and a future. In the course of the journey, people live, work, and think together and there is likely to be at least the tentative emergence of a common mind, a common spirit, as well as a common work. And the idea of shared future, denied by tendencies of fragmentation, polarization, stalemate, is a given. And it seems to me, if these Toledo dialogues are to be effective, we will need to travel all four journeys. Historical. A lot of work has been done to appreciate the history of the three faiths represented here. Chaim and Peter's talks reminded us of the history of Spain, Al-Andalus, El Sefarad. It's a history of three faiths. Wherever and with whomever we engage in dialogue, we need to understand their history, their story. The public journey. Those of us giving papers have been reminded by Peter of a forthcoming publication. And the public aspect of our time together has been built in to the objectives outlined on the first day. And it is that public aspect of it, which I think is both a challenge and a gift. Once two people can come to an understanding, there then comes the often courageous step of sharing it with others, whether that be as a member of a local faith community or as a religious leader with broader reach. The private journey the conversations that happen in the gaps between formal sessions or in interactions away from the public gaze. This is when people get to know each other, with initial wariness moving on to a quieter, stiller listening, to gentle venturing into sensitive areas, to warmer, less detached interest in different beliefs, a move from curiosity to respect is in the essence of the spiritualities of all three faiths and other faiths. It makes possible a more attentive way of life. To do anything reflectively is to nurture the connection with a deeper self. This journey pauses, considers, tends to the other journeys and holds them together when, as so easily happens, they slip apart. Out of it grows the transformation of which Julianne spoke in answer to Chaim. The evidence of the last two days to wait and see for tomorrow, is that we have at least set off on each of these journeys. So my own experience covers both what are official dialogues, dialogue initiatives, and more grassroots dialogue and encounter. And in the previous terms of wanting to distinguish between dialogue and encounter, 
both are present in each of these. And there is a mixture of the dialogue of ideas of the, and of the dialogue of life. And although I shall need to re-examine this in the light of what I've learned today, also the dialogue of the heart. What I thought might be uh, useful uh, is to share some paragraphs from uh, Generous Love and give some specific experiences with which I've been connected to a greater or lesser degree as a way of illustrating them in action, illustrating this theology in action, as it were. And I think I'm going to have to compress that a bit, So, but if any of them peak uh, interest uh, or might be helpful to you, then uh, let us pick that up in what I hope will be a bit of time for question and answer afterwards, or a time outside uh, these formal sessions. In looking at the contemporary context and the uh, Anglican heritage, there are three acknowledgements. And that's, once again, uh, at this wonderful trinity. It's no way uh, designed to be exclusive of those who do not have a Trinitarian interpretation and understanding of God. But it does offer a paradigm of confidence and humility as something, uh, quoting from Generous Love, urgent to Anglicans to live out in a multi-religious and interfaith world. So, acknowledging that there is one God, the Creator. An Anglican approach dismisses nothing as outside God's concern, but attends to the world in its manifold differences, in the expectation that it ultimately coheres, having one source and one goal in God. This is a discipline against sectarianism and a resource for living with plurality. It's a quote of the first acknowledgement. Well, uh, in, a, in a way, that's just me recognising uh, what I share with the rest of creation and existence that depends on God. Uh, but that union, that it, it it is that union that is brought out in some of our explorations of the mystical tradition this morning and the Carmelite spirituality that Sister Jo has spoken of. For those on this journey, the plurality itself becomes something that can offer gentle rain and promote our spiritual growth. A second acknowledgement, acknowledging that God, quoting, that, that God is manifest in the particular human life of the Son. As Jesus' ministry, and as Jesus' ministry initiated an indefinite series of particular encounters, now limitless in reach in the light of his resurrection, so the Anglican Church has sought in making decisions to attend to the particular contexts of its work. It has treated with caution generalized claims made for timeless and ahistorical systems. I guess that's the Theresen local informing the global. And as examples, I draw on uh, something like the uh, rabbi and clergy uh, encounters sponsored by the Council for Christians and Jews, or uh, in uh, my diocese in Egypt, a program in Christian and Muslim schools uh, called Planting a Tree of Hope, where the schools come together to plant a tree, or the imam and priest exchange there, where imams and priests are seen walking together in the street, overcoming a sense that it's fine, there are Christians over there, we're Muslims over here, as long as we don't talk to each other, we'll be able to get along just fine. This is showing something beyond coexistence, coming together as leaders and giving permission for, in a local context, giving permission that can flow out into the community. And a third acknowledgement, that the work of the Holy Spirit is not just about inwardness, but provides the operative conditions for flourishing social life. 
Anglicanism has sought the formation of social contexts in which pressures towards liberty and towards order are both made to subserve a positive vision of human community. To minister to whole communities, to find ways of enabling people of robustly differing convictions to live together so that a public good may be formed. My previous example may serve, or uh, something like uh, the, the work for communities that uh, was done out of the dialogue between the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Chief Rabbinate of Israel, where we brought in a, a Muslim a representative to create the beginnings of what became the Council of Religious Leaders or Institutions of the Holy Land, uh, where the three faiths met around uh, the table. Or, or a tour on which I've been with the Council of Christians and Jews to uh, Israel and Palestine with Christian and Jewish leaders to seek to understand the lived reality of the uh, experience of both Jewish and uh, uh, Jewish Israeli and uh, Palestinian Israeli, uh, Arab Israeli and Palestinian uh, Arab communities. So I'm mixing up uh, religion and ethnic uh, things there. But going together with a rabbi and, uh, uh, and uh, another um, lady into Ramallah, which as Israeli citizens is um, not encouraged, I'm looking for, for uh, kind of, you know, to be fearful, to, to sit alongside an amuse, fearful that this is actually a dangerous thing to do. Going into the very heart of God is a natural link to Reza's poignant reflection on prayer, which I think I have just about enough time to read before passing back uh, to Peter, probably, I suspect, to go straight into Mark's talk, uh, or, yeah, we'll have some. or hopefully there'll be some time for questions. But here, here is uh, 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 Reza Shah Qasimi on, uh, on prayer. Uh, that's him over there. <laughs> <laughs> we alone are free to direct our awareness to the source whence it emerged and to integrate it therein. The source of our limited awareness is not only infinite consciousness, it is also absolute reality and perfect love. Prayer, at its deepest or most contemplative, is the most direct means by which the human accident returns to the divine substance. The drop of human awareness returns to the ocean of divine reality. Prayer, at whatever level, helps to displace egocentric consciousness, granting us a taste of the spiritual joy that accompanies liberation from the ego, rendering transparent the contours defining the drop of individual consciousness. As the stranglehold of the false, egocentric self loosens, one senses a very real possibility of realising one's true self in the bosom of the real. And such self-realisation, in the measure of its authenticity, overflows as the gift of self to others. What one gives to the neighbour is heartfelt love. <clears throat> For one has tasted the love that flows from the heart of the real. To be human is to be capable of prayer. And to pray is to bring to fruition the blessed seeds of beatific reality embedded within the human heart. And so is our dialogue of the heart, sustaining the dialogue of life and the dialogue of ideas.
Thank you.